In this bonus episode of Silent Podcasts, we speak with Maya Bloomberg, a board-certified family nurse practitioner. She specializes in hematology and is passionate about the sickle cell patients she treats. Not only is this episode super inspiring, it's a wealth of information for sickle cell patients and advocates alike. In our opinion, there's no better way to end Sickle Cell Awareness Month than with this episode of Silent Podcast. A big thing that providers need to do is to actually listen to the patient and treat a patient like it's one of your family members or somebody who is loved and what type of care would you want them to receive rather than seeing somebody in the emergency room and just automatically mislabel them for somebody because that was one of the eye-opening things for me is when I was an inpatient bedside nurse, I really, again, I only saw the pain and the anemia, the blood transfusions, the dilated every two hours, et cetera. But then when I went on the outpatient world, I, my patients really, they do everything that they can to take care of themselves and take, stay out of the hospital. And something a patient told me, we're not faking being in pain, we're faking feeling well. And that stuck with me so much because mm-hmm. if other emergency room doctors really let that resonate with them, I think it would change the type of care that they receive. Welcome to The Silent Podcast, where our focus is to strike out the silenced voices of those affected by sickle cell disease. We believe that by creating a platform to talk about real life situations through the lens of sickle cell, we can change the stigma one voice at a time. Each episode, we will feature individuals who are changing the narrative of sickle cell. We hope that by sharing these stories, this podcast will inspire not only those living with the disease, but anybody that's listening to boldly persevere, confidently speak their truth, and courageously follow their dreams. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Silent Podcast. I'm Christina Lachelle. And I'm Ijama Ezene. And we have just had such a phenomenal, I think that's the only, that's the best word that I can use to describe it, conversation uh, with Maya Bloomberg. Maya is a nurse practitioner based out of Miami, Florida, and she was so knowledgeable on the topic of sickle cell. Um, and it was just really a joy talking to her. There are some times when people are really knowledgeable about things and when they explain it to you, it's hard to understand, but with her, it was such a conversation and easy to understand. So um, I just, I know Ijama, Ijama go ahead and, and, and jump in because I just can't speak enough. It was such a great conversation. Yeah, it was an amazing conversation. This is actually one of the podcasts that I've been looking forward to having. Um, I like when we're able to get um, people within the medical field as guests um, outside of just having patients um, speak, but being able to hear it from the provider side. And so being able to hear her speak from such a knowledgeable um, platform, Mm -hmm. I'm like... I'm at all. <laughs> um, like, seriously, I wish there were more um, hematologists even like her, you know, like you said, she was a nurse practitioner um, out of the Miami area. Um, she spoke a lot about how to care for yourself as a sickle cell patient. What are some of the new um, things out there to be able to help you? Um, advocating for yourself in general, and also talk to healthcare providers on how best they can help advocate for their patients. So mm-hmm. shared a lot of really, really good things, which leads me to our voice of truth for today. Awareness is the greatest agent for change at heart tall. Like, I feel like that literally describes her, like her level of awareness um, has allowed her to be a change agent for people with sickle cell. Um, And so I'm just really excited to get into it. Um, Even with sharing, I can't even pick a favorite part of the conversation because the entire conversation was my favorite. So I feel like we should just (laughs) get right into it and then let the listeners pick their favorite themselves. Yeah. And I I love how open she was people reaching out. So definitely listen and also follow follow her on Instagram. Um, She has such a great knowledgeable page for you to um, dive into. All right, let's go. Let's get into it. And here's a quick message from our sponsor. Hi, everyone. Welcome again to the Silent Podcast. We're here with Maya Bloomberg, who is a certified, a board certified family nurse practitioner at Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center in Jackson Memorial Hospital. 
She earned both her bachelor's and master of science in nursing degrees from University of Miami. <laughs> She's worked as a hematology nurse practitioner for almost seven years, specializing in sickle cell and bleeding disorders, which shed light on the significant health and racial disparities that exist in modern medicine. This led her to create a social media page, the Heme NP, like hematology nurse practitioner, devoted to providing reliable information to sickle cell patients so they can better advocate for their advocate for their health with hopes of bridging this disparity. Let's all welcome Maya Bloomberg. Hey, Maya, thank you so much for taking the time to be on this podcast. I've been looking forward to this particular one with you just from looking at your Instagram page and all the things that you have advocating for sickle cell. You've actually helped me a lot in terms of some of the things you shared. Like I think today you shared something too about fasting and I sent that to my sister because I talk to her about that all the time because she's serious about her intermittent fasting and she also has sickle cell. And I try to tell her like she needs to be cautious and make sure that she's eating and things like that. So I, literally when you posted that, I forwarded it right to her. Oh, I'm so happy to hear that. <laughs> um, so I appreciate you. But yeah, thank you so much for taking the time to be on this podcast today. So we normally ask people what their one word is around their journey in the sickle cell space. So what would you say your one word is? I would say awakening or eye-opening, hyphenated. Mm. I love it. So yeah, so um, again, thank you so much for coming on here. We wanna give you a chance to share. So some of the things like I was saying earlier, um, a lot of the things that you post, a lot of things that you share have been eye-opening <laughs> for me as um, a sickle cell warrior or somebody living with sickle cell. What got you into this space? Sure, so I started this fairly recently during the pandemic. It was actually February of this year. I read a really startling statistic in an article talking about COVID and how life expectancy has decreased. And it's no surprise that life expectancy across the board has decreased. However, when we broke it down by race, we saw that it was disproportionately affecting people of color where Caucasians would have a decline by one year, Hispanics 1.7 years and Black Americans 2.7 years, so almost three years. And there was really no reason that having increased melanin in your skin makes you higher risk for having complications or death. It really is a multitude of reasons of distrust in the science and the government, mm -hmm. access to care, um, especially yeah. exposure risk, because a lot of patients don't necessarily have the luxury to work remotely during the pandemic. So when I saw the statistic, I'm like, well, what can I do to use my expertise to kind of bridge this gap? So I decided initially to start with just sickle cell type of education, because when you get connected with a hematology oncology doctor, you're not necessarily going to have a sickle cell specialist. You might have somebody who does more oncology and really just view sickle cell as pain and only treat you with pain medication. Mm -hmm. So I figured I could use my knowledge, post relevant information, and more importantly, reliable information that's easy to understand to ultimately allow patients to have better conversations with their providers and improve health outcomes that way. Awesome. So you um, touched on the whole like aspect of care and then also looking at it from not necessarily having the information or the knowledge that you need. And so I know, for example, like I go to a cancer center for my hematologist um, and so their focus is cancer. Um, and so he, they kind of have an understanding of um, what I'm dealing with with sickle cell because they have like other patients. But what got you, I guess, connected to working with sickle, sickle cell in general mm -hmm. um, throughout your career? It really was luck. So I was a bedside nurse on a med surge tele floor and I took care of countless sickle cell patients while they were hospitalized. And I saw lots of great doctors, lots of terrible doctors. So when I became a nurse practitioner, something that was important to me was to be connected with the doctor who actually respected and cared for their patients and didn't treat them like a number. So I wasn't necessarily as focused on the specialty I went in, I was more focused on the doctor. And I got connected with Dr. Thomas Harrington, who is anybody who listens to this and knows him will only be able to speak positive things about him, but his energy is completely magnetic and he's a sickle cell specialist, he's a hematologist and oncologist, probably one of the smartest people I know, but starting to work with him and taking care of patients outside the hospital, it really opened up my eyes to what sickle cell patients experience. And it kind of 
stimulated me and his magnetic energy made me really passionate because I would see the care that my patients who are doing everything they can to stay out of the hospital, to go into the emergency room, be racially profiled and not receive the care that they deserve just because of a few patients who might overutilize the healthcare system. So it really opens up my eyes to seeing the disparity between inpatient versus outpatient and just the care they were getting in total that it's kind of pushed me to try to be that voice because patients need it. I think sickle cell patients especially are really underrepresented and there's no reason for that. And I do all hematology. So yes, my area of specialty is sickle cell. I also care for a lot of bleeding disorder patients. So something that was so startling right from the beginning was that I take care of hemophilia patients, which is less prevalent than sickle cell, but the amount of resources and the funding mm -hmm. that was available is just astronomically more compared to sickle cell, which was extremely more prevalent. So it became really obvious early on how there are discrepancies. And unfortunately, since it really affects people of color so frequently, uh, or more predominantly, I should say, I think the racial aspect of it is heightened. But really just getting connected with Dr. Harrington and seeing and meeting the patients that he's been taking care of for all of these years and the compassion that he had towards his patient, I couldn't help but just adopt his entire patient population and be just as compassionate and be just as much of an advocate uh, towards them. Yeah, I appreciate you talking about race because Generally, you see Black people talking about sickle cell, and you are one of our first non-Black guests. So I, we really appreciate you. And we we saw the advocacy, and we were like, what makes her so passionate? So to hear your story about being connected to a doctor who is passionate about it and, and being an advocate for sickle cell is, is awesome. Um, it, it also makes me think, when I was hearing you talk about the, the so many sickle cell patients that you've seen, it makes me think about you living in Florida. Can you talk a little bit about how sickle cell is connected in Florida? I hear like there's a really large population in Florida. Um, yes. So sickle cell, I mean, we have the number one rate of sickle cell cases in Florida. So it's not that surprising if you think colds is a common trigger for a sickle cell crisis. So let's get away mm -hmm. from the colds and come down to Florida. But then you have to deal with all of the, the rainy months and hurricane season, which brings a whole nother slew of <laughs> sickle cell crises. But Florida is the most prevalent in the entire country. And I think Houston or Texas, excuse me, might be number two or three with the number of cases in the country too. Hmm. That's interesting. I didn't, know, I didn't know that. Yeah, that is very interesting. So what are your thoughts in terms of like, because I know you talked about it from the hospital perspective and inpatient and outpatient care. What are your thoughts in terms of advocacy when it comes to um, sickle cell and what you've seen um, or heard from your patients? I would say over the past five years, it's definitely improved. But when I first started in my career and I would have people locate translocating to Florida, they would ask me what type of support groups and whatnot existed in Florida. I was kind of embarrassed because we didn't have anything that was really well established and worth promoting for us. But over the past few years, there have been a few that have definitely push their steam and they have a lot of followings and they do a lot for the community. The biggest one local to us in South Florida is ASAP, um, Advancing Sickle Cell Advocacy Project. And the person who started this foundation has a, a child affected with sickle cell and wasn't happy with the type of care or the lack of care that she was receiving and created this group to again, bring awareness, probably a similar reason how the Ruby Ball Foundation came into being as well to help spread awareness and ultimately improve the health outcomes. So that's been a big one. And I think in light of the pandemic with a lot of things going virtually, it's been really nice because a lot of foundations have been able to have a bigger reach because of that virtual and Zoom meetings and being able to share invitations to people across the country. So I hope that she continues to grow because she's met with representatives. And I'm just very hopeful that the advocacy work that she's doing is hopefully going to bring some legislative change in Florida. That's awesome. So, so being a nurse practitioner who's treated different patients, what do you see as being key or important to how sickle cell patients receive treatment from doctors? It's very hard. I don't want to generalize, but it, it is obvious that there are some providers who don't necessarily treat the patients objectively. Uh, they just want to go based on what the labs are, what they have predetermined in their head. I think a big thing that providers need to do is to actually listen to the patient and treat a patient like it's one of your family members or somebody who is loved and what type of care would you want them to receive rather than seeing somebody in the emergency room and just automatically mislabel them for somebody. Because that was one of the eye-opening things for me is 
when I was an inpatient bedside nurse, I really, again, I only saw the pain and the anemia, the blood transfusions, the dilated every two hours, et cetera. But then when I went on the outpatient world, I, my patients really, they do everything that they can to take care of themselves and take, stay out of the hospital. And something a patient told me, we're not faking being in pain, we're faking feeling well. And that stuck with me so much because mm -hmm. if other emergency room doctors really let that resonate with them, I think it would change the type of care that they receive. That was good that you shared that. I'm like, I never even thought about thinking about it from that perspective, but that is the truth. Um, and one of the things that came up with one of the last um, podcast um, guests that we had was, again, like the pain medication um, and knowing the type of pain medication to give to sickle cell patients. Um, one of the things that I've seen within myself and then also, like I told you, I have a twin brother and a younger sister that has sickle cell. Morphine doesn't work for us, right? And then there's certain things over the counter, um, not over, not necessarily over the counter, but other like um, pain medications uh -huh. that aren't, you know, what I mean, that aren't necessarily right for us because either, you know, what I mean, we used to get it when we were younger, so our body doesn't react to it the same way. Um, one of the things that I have seen that has um, worked um, was what you mentioned was Dilaudid mm -hmm. um, in Houston. Um, there are some hospitals that say that they don't give Dilaudid anymore. Um, to patients um, for whatever reason. And so having an understanding of the disease and you know what I mean, like the needs of particular patients and what works for a particular patient, I feel is key. So what are some of the things that you've seen when it comes to pain medication and pain management for um, your patients um, and how they're treated um, within the medical community? Sure. So there's a couple points I want to touch on. So one thing you had mentioned is things that you took when you were a child now don't work for you. So a big thing to talk about is opioid tolerance and dependence. And mm -hmm. we can touch a little on withdrawal and addiction, but it's important for patients to understand that when you take narcotics, you're going to develop tolerance over time, which means the more you take dilated or the more you take your Percocet or even your Tylenol with coating, you're going to get to a point where your body just does not respond to the medication like you used to. And that is what tolerance is. But then you get to a point where you do kind of form a dependence to it. And it's very different than addiction because addiction is more of like a psychological dependence where with sickle cell, it's more of a physical dependence because you need the pain. You're having sickle cell pain, so you need to address it. However, sometimes if you take pain medication for a prolonged period of time, then all of a sudden, if you're not taking it, you can develop withdrawal symptoms, which patients describe as I feel really sick, but you mm -hmm. take your pain medicine and you feel better. So that is a withdrawal symptom and it's a physical dependence to your narcotics. So when it comes to pain management, I really take a, a holistic approach when it comes to that. I'm not one, and Dr. Harrington is not one to just escalate a patient's narcotic doses quickly. And sometimes we lose patients for that because they rather go up to Broward County and have a doctor who would just give them oxycodone 30 milligram tablets, no problem. But for us, if I have a 20 year old, I don't want to escalate your dose that quickly because by the time you're 30 or 40 years old, I want you to still have medication at safe doses that you're going to respond to. So I think it's important to consider other pain management strategies outside of opioids or in addition to opioids. So when you're having a sickle cell crisis, your body's in this pro-inflammatory state. So mm -hmm. something patients can use in addition is taking NSAIDs, so non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. So that's something just like your ibuprofen, Motrin, Aleve. If you have any kidney disease, things like that, it's not necessarily the best recommendation, but sometimes taking that with your pain medication, we call it a synergistic effect where it has an added effect and you can get really good control of your pain. There's also some patients who have chronic pain. So patients with chronic pain, we kind of take a better strategy. We might do a short acting narcotic like Percocet with the long acting like fentanyl patches or MS Contin. And when it comes to long acting narcotics, you don't get that immediate relief of pain like you get from a short acting, but it stays in your system much longer. So instead of having peaks and valleys of the pain medicine having effect, you have a kind of a steady wave that you have to ride out. Also something to consider for chronic pain is or under addressed in sickle cell pain is the nerve component of pain because we have specific medications that address nerve pain like gabapentin or Lyrica. And then more recently in different sickle cell conferences and speaking to other experts, things that they've incorporated in managing sickle cell pain has been medicines like duloxetine or Elevil, which are actually antidepressants. And I always will say it up front because I don't want my patients to think I'm being sneaky trying to put them on an antidepressant <laughs> medication. But now we're starting to see that the, some of these antidepressants offer additional relief of nerve pain, especially for those with chronic pain. 
So I think we kind of have to take a whole look on how we are managing pain. I don't think that patients should just take their pain medication like Skittles and understand what tolerance is and what dependence is and how that translates to the future because it might make you manage your pain a little bit differently to kind of mitigate that risk. And then I'm all about CBD. I, I Even with medical marijuana, yeah. I think everything should just be legalized at this point and we'd be out of our deficit since they'd be able to tax that. But I think that there's more issues that we're going to see with opioids in the long run than we would see with medical marijuana or CBD, which has a lot of uh, anti-inflammatory properties too. Mm. I love how you shared all of that. That was that a mouthful. <laughs> yes. yes. That was I like, knowledge. You know, like I, I hate taking pain medication. So it's like, I'm the type of person that's like, unless I'm like in no. the hospital or like I get to that point, even though they know you're supposed to like get in front of it, but it's like, I'll do the ibuprofens or do the other things before I get to the point of taking the pain medication. And then I always tell my doctor, like, don't prescribe me um, Percocet. <laughs> And then because you go to like, the hospital and then your doctor is doubting that you're even in yeah. pain. Yeah. Because I'm like, I don't like, because I know, I know you said like what Perka said, it does have that delay. And I always want to like, it's not working. <laughs> so like, that's how I always felt like whenever I got Percocet, it was like, it wasn't working. Then it had that delayed effect. And I didn't like how it made me feel like, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like in my head outside of yeah. like that. So it's the like, okay, part. first it had a delayed effect. Now it's finally working, but then I also feel kind of loopy. So I don't like to take it so I usually try like not to take any pain medication um, unless I'm in the hospital. And then if I'm at home, um, if I do have pain medication at home, I have Tramadol, but I literally probably take it like once a year. Um, but in between the times I'll try to do the ibuprofen or find other things to try to help manage my pain um, when I'm at home. But I love how you shared all of those different um, aspects. I mean, I had to pull some of that. <laughs> I know, right? I, I, yeah, like, I feel um, like you could take that snippet and just share it with some people who are, yeah. who are maybe struggling or trying to think about different ways to manage their pain. Um, but on top of it, we now have newer therapies also to manage the pain. So, I mean, since we have hydroxyurea, which has been studied since the 80s, and we all know it wasn't even created for sickle cell. But mm -hmm. again, somebody, I mean, the way hydroxyurea works, it slows down DNA synthesis in patients with sickle cell. They produce too much and everything in excess. So they applied that to sickle cell and started studying it back in the 80s and started noticing positive effects that we're at the point now where we put babies who are born with sickle cell. But in the past five years, we finally have therapies that have been approved for specifically sickle cell. The first one was Endari, which was the first uh, therapy in decades for sickle cell. And then 18 months ago is when we had the two newer therapies, Oxprida by GBT and then Adacvio by Novartis. And Adacvio is a medication that kind of addresses that inflammatory process that I briefly talked on. Um, and that's a good option for patients who still haven't been able to optimize their management with hydroxyurea or get control over their pain. And this is, again, we're getting connected with a good hematologist who understands sickle cell is so important because if you're seeing somebody who isn't aware of these newer therapies, they're just going to continue writing your pain medication. You're going to continue to get dependent and tolerant to it, where now we have a therapy that I believe it was like 36% of patients had zero pain on the clinical trial. And then more than half of them had a significant reduction in the number of days in pain, hospitalization rates, et cetera. So I think there's a lot of new therapies and there's a lot of research finding even newer therapies and more research looking for the cure in the future with gene editing and bone marrow transplants, et cetera. So I think we have a, a very promising future in the sickle cell standpoint. So we have to really be mindful about opioids because again, I really think that once we get to that point where we're curing our patients of sickle cell, if they've been dealing with decades of pain medication, we're then going to have to deal with detoxing and just all of the sequelae yes. issues with opioids. And that's one of the things that I've been I, I've been wondering as we've been talking about these different pain meds and the different uh, medicines that people can be on. What do you see? Because we have like the physical effects of sickle cell, but then we also have like the mental and emotional effects of sickle cell. What do you see as the correlation or the connection? Um, they go hand in hand. I mean, yeah. mental health and sickle cell go hand in hand. We know that almost like, I think it's a third of patients or so have some mental illness, whether it's anxiety or depression with sickle cell and patients who have chronic pain, which is around 40% of patients with sickle cell have uh, mental health and depression too. And when you have depression and anxiety, you have more pain, you have more severe pain, you have mm -hmm. more hospitalizations. And it makes sense because say you're anxious and you're having, all of a sudden you have a little bit of sickle cell pain start. Is this going to throw me into the hospital? Is this going to get better? Is it not? And that type of stress, people think it's only physical stress that can trigger a crisis, 
emotional stress can trigger crises just as well. So anxiety can just be a really vicious cycle of exacerbating your symptoms. Depression, I mean, we have just depression without sickle cell, you can have somatization where you really develop physical symptoms and pain Mm -hmm. from depression alone. So imagine that with a condition that does cause pain and just the psychological stress of depression, they totally go hand in hand. And I feel like it's not always addressed. And I think we need to do a better job addressing it and really just normalizing seeing a specialist or speaking to somebody or just speaking out about mental health. I think over the past couple of years, we really have been doing better about breaking that stigma associated with it, but it's constantly a battle. I, I really do. I recommend my patients seeing therapists and I, I brief mm-hmm. it and I preface it in a way that I don't, I'm not saying you have a mental right. health condition or a mental disorder. You're living with a chronic condition, which is hard. You're living with a condition where stress can trigger your crises that seeing a specialist who is completely non-biased, they know nothing about you except what you're telling them, they can help you come up with coping strategies or better ways to manage your stress and handle certain situations. And one of the providers that we send a lot of our patients to, he does cognitive behavioral therapy, where you actually use your mind to overcome some pain. So I think Mm -hmm. psychologists are definitely a resource that's underutilized. So I hope whoever's listening to this realizes that there really is a a large percentage of patients dealing with mental health with sickle cell, even caregivers, there's a lot of uh, mental health issues seen in the caregiver. And it's important to know that you're not alone. And there's really no shame asking for help. And especially with sickle cell, you were born with sickle cell. It's not like you chose to have it, that there really, again, is no shame to seeking help and support from either friends or a professional. Or yeah, and I'm glad that you shared that because that's one of the big things outside of the pain. Um, a lot of people with sickle cell because they don't like being seen um, in a place of weakness, right? And so it's like, if you're in pain, you don't want people to always feel like they have to help you or you can't do certain things. So when it comes to like work, when it comes to being in school, even for students, and it's like you end up missing school because you're in pain. Mm-hmm. So it's like, you're having to cope with that and think, okay, how am I going to push through that? So I know like, with me growing up or even like with work back before, like having to be in the hospital, I'm like, okay, I have this deliverable to do, right? I have these things that I need to turn in for work. And I'm so focused on that to where it's like, I don't want people to feel as though I'm not doing my part of the bargain or I'm not getting my work done, right? To where it's like, again, that adds on that stress and that makes Mm -hmm. it even worse when it's just like, okay, it's okay. Like you can, you know what I mean? Like, Right. Do what you need to do for yourself right now and put that work to the side. Like it'll be, it'll be fine. Um, and, when, and so having that understanding of like how, you know what I mean? Of that balance and knowing that it's okay. And so that's part of two, why we have this podcast so that we can help amplify those voices. So people know they're not alone mm-hmm. and you don't have to deal with this by yourself and that you don't have to see your sickle cell from a place of weakness, but of strength. And so right. you being asking for people. help is so strong. Like having yeah. the courage to ask help is like a whole nother level of strength that people don't realize. Yeah. And with COVID, and so- I mean, so much is virtual now. So I understand people not necessarily wanting to people to know that they're having, but we're doing so much virtually that most of the psychologists are doing appointments via telemedicine. Now that you can do it in the private of your home, in your car, you can isolate yourself and nobody could even know. And then one thing you mentioned, I just wanted to touch on is having sickle cell disease, you are covered under the American Disability Act. So this is important for jobs, for school. Um, Your employer can't fire you because of missed days of work if you were hospitalized or in a crisis. So if anybody's not aware, you can go to your HR department and request FMLA forms. And this essentially will cover and protect your job. Say you were hospitalized or had to call out for a sickle cell crisis, it secures your job. And then for those who are in school, you can go to every school or university will have a disability department and you can go to them and ask for an accommodations form. And we can ask for accommodations for uh, excuse from any missed assignments or late assignments or missed testing, missed class. We can ask for extended testing because we do know patients with sickle cells, sometimes they do have slower cognitive functioning, which it, it's been proven in a study. I'm not saying anything insulting at all, but knowing some of these uh, complications and issues we see in sickle cell, it's, it, I would say take advantage of the resources and the accommodations that you can take uh, that are applicable for you. And same with your work employers. If you feel like you have the vascular necrosis of your hips and standing for an entire shift is challenging, I can request that your employer allows you to have a chair where you're sitting. There's different accommodations and things that you can speak about with your provider and request from your employer or from your school to kind of decrease some of that stress from your body and mentally. 
Yeah. And then I'm glad that you touched on that because that's another thing. Like when you are looking for jobs and you're applying for stuff and they have that part with the American Disability Act, sickle cell isn't on the list. And so people, you know what I mean, won't even think to like do that. But then they have like certain things like cancer and different stuff. So understanding that it's not taking anything away from you, but it's helping you if you do um, say that you do, you know what I mean, say that you have a particular disability. Um, it's meant to help you. Um, and so exactly. it's meant to help give you those like accommodations if necessary. So don't take it as a thing that's knocking you or you know, making you feel that less than, because I feel like that's the biggest thing that we need to share with people is that it's not taking anything away from you for you to be open about what you're dealing with. Um, yeah. All that it's doing is helping to provide resources to better support you and to help you along the way. Yeah, I mean, this is, that's huge, Maya. I did not know that sickle cell was covered under ADA at all. And that, I mean, that- And I didn't know it was like listed. For some people because- yeah, People don't I, see it on the list, so they don't think about it. So I feel like that's a big thing. So letting people know, like, that is something that they can do. Because you look at the list and even though it's like, it's not a, like, all-encompassing list, but just knowing, like, based off of things that you're dealing with, that you're working with, that is something that you would put down. Right. And I, I, I remember my sister um, was working in a position once where, you know, it, she felt she didn't feel right about, you know, telling her employer that she was in the hospital for a crisis and it felt, and then, you know, she was, she got out of the hospital and she was back in the hospital and her employer was like, oh, you're back in the, you know what I mean? So it's, there's a lot of judgment there from employers, especially when they don't understand um, the disease, but knowing that it's covered under ADA and that you can go and, you know, flush your paperwork when you're starting a new job and say, like, I hope that this doesn't come up, but this is something that could. And it, you know, I may need some accommodations in the future, like giving your employer a heads up. That's, like I said, that could be life changing for some people. That's huge. And then, I would and say as you said, that some employers, they don't necessarily understand how you could go in and out of the hospital, that I've had pa employers who think my patients are just using the conditions to yeah. get out of work. And I would say, if you have an employer or a teacher, anybody who's questioning, that's when you ask your provider to contact them directly. Because I've had several conversations and emails kind of helping explain and understand the unpredictability of sickle cell because it really they're so misunderstood and people really only associated by the pain but they don't realize the unpredictability the severity the complications that comes with every single crisis I mean I had a 24 year old who literally he never got sick in the entire time that I knew him he just graduated with his engineering degree he comes to clinic one day and he's like visibly uncomfortable which is super rare because again he's he was super smart he was always reading a book and just really nice gentle man and he's in pain, he ends up going to the hot, we give him medicine and sent him to the ER and the following day he dies. And I feel like mm -hmm. people don't really understand how delicate sickle cell is and they just assume patients are just need their pain medication, but there's so many complications. I always say anywhere blood can travel, sickle cell can affect, which is why we can see complications literally in your entire body. And every time you have a crisis, you are at risk for a complication. And I'm not trying to say this to instill fear or anything. It's more just for patient or a for people who aren't a patient to be more empathetic and really understand what patients with sickle cell are going through. I mean, the psychological burden of sickle cell is just insane. It doesn't surprise me that so many people have anxiety for it because you never know what's going to happen, but I don't want patients to listen to me and live in fear and think like, oh shit, is this, excuse me, is this going to be the crisis that ends all? But you, it's really more of just a way for you to advocate for yourself in the sense that know what your triggers are, try to avoid your triggers, keep on top of your doctor's appointment, wash your hands, wear your mask, get vaccinated, whoever's listening and didn't get a COVID vaccine. And if you're hesitant, please look on my Instagram and the post <laughs> I did. And if you have any lingering doubts or hesitations, please DM me because COVID and sickle cell we know has worse outcomes. And we know, again, life expectancy and the death rates are higher among people of color compared to those without that we really need to protect ourselves. And a lot of the misinformation that's out there unfortunately spreads so much faster. So if there's anybody who is listening and just wants to talk to me about any concerns they have over the vaccine, please reach out because that's another uh, big outreach that I've been doing. And again, I have no direct personal gain at all for anybody who gets vaccinated. Again, I just see this disparity and I see a lot of the people who don't have trust in the vaccine and aren't getting the vaccine are people of color. And then again, we're seeing higher death rates. And now we're seeing all of these hospitalizations and deaths and the majority of patients hospitalized over 95% are unvaccinated. So that's a very important thing, but I would just make sure you 
to sum back where my main point was, is just to be very proactive with your health and stay on top of your appointments, stay on top of your screening test, get connected with a sickle cell specialist, or if not, just make sure that you can advocate for yourself and make sure that you're having your routine screenings to make sure your kidneys are fine, your annual eye exams and things like that to make sure you are living a long life. Yeah, two things, because you said a lot and I'm like, everything that you say, I'm like, yes. So I speak so quickly. Too. Too. No, it's like I everything you said, I'm just like, it's such a wealth of information. Um, and so first, like, even how we were talking about like employers, like I've been blessed to have throughout my like life in my careers to have worked for companies where I've had managers understand um, my, you know what I mean, my bout with sickle cell, not necessarily understanding what sickle cell was, but not taking it to where they didn't believe me if I, you know what I mean, like was sick or I was in the hospital to where like, they've been like, I'm gonna put your laptop away. You're in the hospital, <laughs> like so nice. you know, do what you need to do. So I'm like, I've always been blessed in that way because I've heard the horror stories of people not being able to keep a job or things that they've had to deal with um, because of their illness. The second thing that I want to say is I need you to be moved to <laughs> the Virginia, D.C. area <laughs> because I'm like, I need a nurse practitioner like you in my life. Um, you because, tell them that I sit. No, just <laughs> <laughs> because I'm like, everything that you say is so spot on. The way that you know, like the type of pay management for your patients, the way that you know how to talk in terms of like the mental health um, aspect of it. So just everything that you're sharing, I'm just like, I wish that there were more providers, healthcare yeah. providers like you. Me like, too. I can't say that enough. So it's like, I know we had like Dr. Efi, I don't know if you're familiar with Dr. Yeah, Dr. I know. Yeah. Yes, of course. She's we know Dr. Yeah, in North yeah. Carolina. And so like, she was talking again about like, something kind of like what you spoke about earlier is truly being able to see your patient the same way that you would see like your family member understanding that mm -hmm. when people are dealing with certain types of things, they may not be as, you know what I mean? Like open, but if you get to know them, then you'll be able to tell just like how you said the last patient that you had and how he ended up passing away, but you've always known him to like be this lively person, but you could tell something was wrong when you saw him because you knew him. You know what I'm saying? Because you took that time to get to, understand like his mannerisms, certain things, because a lot of people too that are dealing with sickle cell, like you mentioned earlier, they may sit and lie to you about the level of pain that they're dealing with or what they're, you know what I mean, going with, because they don't want you to see them from that, in that light. And so, but if you understand how to work with them, you understand, you get this level of trust with them, then mm -hmm. it makes it easier for them to work with you and for you to be able to know when they need help. And, and then so, you have the other ends of the spectrum, though, where you have patients who are in like 10 out of 10 pain, but you look at them and they don't show it. So I think you have some where you, you develop the relationship and you get to know who the patients are and you pick up on subtle differences and cues exactly. before they even do. But then you have other patients who they might be in terrible pain, but they don't look it and then they get the mm -hmm. mistreatment that way. And I think when we're talking about pain levels, something that I wish we could revisit is we need like an acute pain level and we need chronic pain level because somebody who deals with chronic pain on a daily basis, they might always be five out of 10 yeah. on that pain scale. So when they're in acute pain, it kind of, it blurs the objectiveness of rating your pain when somebody has chronic pain that I feel like there's different areas and, and things that we kind of need to fine tune a little bit to get the best outcomes and, and care provided to sickle cell patients. Yeah, I definitely talked to my sister, like my 10 is not your 10. Like, my 10 is probably your 25 because probably. you've experienced such levels of pain that I don't even comprehend, you know? So th I think that's, I think that's true about the, the chronic pain versus the acute pain. Yeah. So we've talked a lot about sickle cell, but on your page, I noticed that you also kind of mentioned um, some things about sickle cell trait and how some people have, who have sickle cell trait also have symptoms of sickle cell and it impacts them at, at a rate that's maybe higher than someone who's just a carrier of a disease. Can you talk a little bit more about that or what you've seen? Sure. So just so we all have the same definition, sickle cell disease is when you get one abnormal copy from each of your parents. So you have two abnormal hemoglobin genes, where sickle cell trait is when you get just one abnormal hemoglobin from one parent. 
Um, generally speaking, the patients with sickle cell trait, they're going to lead normal lives and have no symptoms. But the post that you're talking about was just to address, there are rare occasions where sickle cell trait patients can have complications and can experience sickle cell-like pain. It's usually, I mean, it's very rare. If you have a sickle cell trait patient who's having pain on the regular, like a sickle cell disease patient, in my mind, I'm thinking, is there some type of oxygenation issue that's contributing to it, like sleep apnea, maybe asthma? But other than that, um, patients who can have very rare occasion pain episodes when they're super dehydrated or more commonly if they're in high altitude. I'm not sure if anybody's aware of Ryan Clark. He was the Pittsburgh Steelers player who in 2007, he was playing in Denver in the high altitude, playing a football game. So he's overexerting himself. He's got two whammies on that one. And unbeknownst to him, he had sickle cell traits. So he develops severe debilitating pain to the left side of his stomach. He goes to the hospital finds out he has a splenic infarct where the blood flow essentially just was cut off because of the blocked sickle cells was decreasing the blood flow to his spleen. Um, and I'm assuming, he, I'm sure he had to get it removed. I didn't get that deep into his history, but it just shows that patients with sickle cell trait can have symptoms. So we shouldn't necessarily brush it under the rug like, oh, it's a benign condition. You'll, you'll live a normal life, no problem. We do the newborn screening, so it's mandated in all of the states to do sickle cell screening. And what's cool is they do an actual hemoglobin electrophoresis, which gives a breakdown of the type of hemoglobin you produce. So we identified those who have sickle cell disease and those who have sickle cell trait. And this all started so we could have early identification of patients to improve the outcome. And since that started, I mean, we see almost 94 and 95% of sickle cell patients living until adulthood. So we do identify sickle cell trait patients as well, but I don't necessarily think enough attention is given to that because say your mom, say you're one of four kids, or even if you have two kids, if your mom wasn't somebody who really remembered that you had sickle cell trait or understood the implications of sickle cell trait, you might live your whole life not knowing you have sickle cell trait. So A, you might not know that maybe you have to be mindful with high altitudes, but B, say you get pregnant. When you get pregnant, they do do newborn screen, or they don't do newborn screening, excuse me. When you get pregnant, they do different prenatal screening, which can pick up if you have sickle cell trait at that point. However, you're already pregnant at that time. And if you test your husband or boyfriend who has sickle cell trait, you already know that there's a probability of having a child and you can't be proactive about it because you're already pregnant. So I really, I wish more was done to address sickle cell trait, maybe in adolescence transitioning to adulthood, because I think there's so much education going around sickle cell trait, specifically on how it means you can pass it on and understanding if you were to get intimate with another person with sickle cell trait, there is that 25% chance that you're, you have an offspring or a child with sickle cell disease. So I think we do need more education on sickle cell trait. And I the blood drive that you were telling me about, the fact that you were able to do sickle cell screening and trait screening at that time is amazing because I think everyone should know their blood type and I think everyone should know their sickle cell status. And just because I'm white does not mean that I don't have sickle cell. I mean, we know sickle That's cell right. can affect every single race and color. Yes, it predominantly affects people of color. I mean, we have when we look across the entire globe, I mean, there's 40,000 people in Europe who has it. There's a million people in India who have it. There's over 5 million in Africa, 100,000 in the United States. But again, it can be all races and color. So just because you don't have melanin or a lot of melanin in your skin doesn't mean you can completely rule out having sickle cell trait because we see it across a lot of different ancestries. So I do encourage people to know what their carrier status is and just it allows you to make an informed decision. Because I know in some countries, like in Nigeria, they will say, if two people have sickle cell trait, they should not get married because mm -hmm. they're not as blessed and lucky as us. I mean, we have first world problems where we have access to all of these medications and we have to bribe people to get vaccinated. But then in other countries, they barely have that. So in Nigeria for sickle cell, their treatment strategy is to avoid birthing kids with sickle cell disease, where in the United States and in the UK, I know there's a lot of patients with sickle cell as well. I think love is love. And I think if you find somebody who has sickle cell disease or sickle cell trait and you want to go in and you know that there is that possibility of you having an offspring with sickle cell disease, I'm fine with that. But you should just go in informed and educate yourself early on. So once you have a baby affected with sickle cell disease, you already know what it is. You know what triggers are. You know what to avoid. You have an idea of what type of doctor's appointments are going to be occurring, what type of vaccinations what type of complications and how you can keep your child as healthy as possible. I think that's totally fine, but you have to know what your status is before you get pregnant to be able to truly go and informed. Hmm. I love every single thing that you shared. <laughs> so sweet. Thank you. Like it's been great. Like we definitely have to have you back on this podcast because yeah. 
so uh, many other things like how you were just talking about like giving birth and um, knowing your status. So like, I'm sure there's other like topics that just stem from that, but we don't have enough time within this particular yeah. segment, but we will definitely have you back on this show. You shared so much information um, and it's been very, very informative. I know back in the beginning, we asked you what your word was. And so I remember you gave us two things. You said eye opening and awakening. So if we could circle back to that. What did you mean by that? So I've kind of have it intertwined in all of our dialogue, but it, the eye opening part was is really when I went from bedside nursing, taking care of patients inpatient to transitioning to my nurse practitioner role, caring for patients outpatient. It really was eye opening seeing my patients who really don't use the hospital system frequently. They take care of themselves. They really are trying to stay out of the hospital yet with the few instances that they go to the ER or get admitted, they had such mistreatment and mm -hmm. stigmatization because of, I mean, it's, it's, I don't wanna say it's because of their race, but I think the fact that it predominantly affects people of color can't help but heighten that racial disparity. It really mm -hmm. opened my eyes to a lot of the mistreatment. And again, I, I take care of a lot of hemophilia patients, which is a super rare bleeding disorder and seeing all of the funding and resources made it really obvious, both the health disparities, the financial disparities, the funding, Mm -hmm. um, so that is why I chose eye opening and awakening because it, it really was, it was eye opening. I mean, when I saw this happen and I'm seeing the mistreatment, it, it's really upsetting that it happened. And I hope to continue to use my voice to help educate patients so they can better advocate for themselves. But more importantly, we really do need more providers to better understand what sickle cell is and what it encompasses and really have providers who are empathetic to our patients. We, patients don't need sympathy. They need empathy. They mm -hmm. need compassion and they need to be believed. So go in open-minded. Uh, when you see a patient, make sure you are treating a patient like a loved one and you are putting any uh, subconscious biases that you might have that affect treatment in your back pocket and it does not belong in the hospital. So I really hope that patients and providers can just have a better understanding of sickle cell and continue to spread awareness and with that end goal of just having the best outcomes for a wonderful group of warriors and caretakers who deserve just as good of a care as any other person. Yeah, wow. So I know I mentioned it in the beginning, but can you tell people where they can find you? Because if you do not follow uh, Maya on Instagram, you need to. If you are interested in sickle cell disease, or if you're just interested in general about some like really interesting facts of of, of being healthy, Maya posts them and it's, it's a really, do you do that page on your own? Like, it's great. It's I do. Great it's yeah. when my kids go to sleep, it's like, I spend at least an, an hour or two. Cause I don't want people thinking that I'm taking away from my work day, uh, <laughs> doing my Instagram. So everything I do is at nighttime, but I mean, I post, it started on sickle cell, but I'm an expert in so many different aspects of mm -hmm. hematology care. So it really is all things hematology, but there is a primary focus on sickle cell. And if anybody has any specific topics of interest. I mean, that's where the fasting post came from is one of my patients is like, hey, my my uh, significant other does a lot of fasting and I'm interested in doing this too. Like, do you, can you do a post? So if anybody is ever interested in a post, you can always DM me and I'll be more than happy to create content because at the end of the day, I want to put information out that is relevant, not just something that I find interesting. So I'm going to continue to keep posting. I'm, I post on COVID. I post on sickle cell, I post on iron overload, which can be intertwined with sickle cell. If you're a patient who gets frequent blood transfusions, we talk about the anemia. So you talk of, I mean, I really, I, I do such a wealth of information and I try to do it in an easy to understand way. So hopefully people can yeah. continue to learn. And again, if anybody has something that they think would make good content and want me to do the research and just create information about it, I'm more than happy to. So at the HEM NP, T-H-E, HEM, H-E-M-E, N-P, like nurse practitioner. I'm on Instagram and happy to help and share my expertise in any way I can. Awesome. Thank you so much. So yeah, again, thank you so much for taking the time to come on our podcast. It's been great. We will definitely have you back because I have a couple of topics on the top of my head. That Me I too. <laughs> awesome. I'm happy um, to hear that. <laughs> we can like uh, like that we can focus on because you are so knowledgeable and just even my experience as a sickle cell patient and yeah you know, I mean dealing with different hematologists and diff dealing with different doctors just hearing your wealth of knowledge and hearing the empathy that you have for your patients 
like I said, like I might have to move to Florida. So. Yeah, I was gonna say, I don't know. I like visiting Baltimore and seeing my family there, but the realistic right. point is coming. I'll come through. Thank you yeah, so thank much. Thank you so much for your time. My pleasure. Thanks yeah, for having me. Yeah, this has been great. Mm -hmm. Thank you.